Good evening. Maybe I should start the introduction when the audience start um, trickling in. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us tonight for the third event of our first project series this year at the American Institute of Architects in Hong Kong. Um, my name is Su Chang. I'm, uh, I'm the chair of the programs committee this year, and I'm so delighted to have the opportunity to give the introduction to our speakers tonight, uh, Mi Jing Yun and Eric Howler. So one thing I actually enjoy about being an architect is that um, you, know, you can always improve and progress by repeating the same act again and again. And it could be a design agenda in your mind, a, a spatial motif you believe in, or you know, something that um, uh, failed you in the last project and you just want to do it one more time and see how you may improve. And in the past seven to eight years, I just by chance had the opportunities to attend the lectures by uh, Mi Jin and Eric for almost at least um, one time a year. And in, you know, in person or online. Um, um, I just feel that um, uh, in that process, um, you know, hearing most of the time the same projects and again and again, um, sometimes some new projects um, occasionally and start to see how um, Eric and Mijin would talk about their work um, sometimes in the same way, sometimes slightly in a different way, and begin to realize how, you know, architect's journey doesn't really just begin or end with the projects, but the projects will also continue to, continue to grow with the architects. And um, so tonight, um, I'm really honored to finally have the opportunity to welcome Eric and Mijin to give the lecture um, here with us at AA Hong Kong. Um, just a very quick introduction of um, our speakers. Um, Mi Jin Yun is a member of AIA, and she is currently Dean of the College of Architecture, Art and Planning at Cornell University. Um, Mi Jin is an architect, designer, and educator. Pre previously, she was a professor and head of the Department of Architecture at MIT, where she began, um, began teaching in 2001. Um, so um, her research investigates the intersection between architecture, technology, and public space. She received the, the uh, Architectural Record New Generation Design Leadership Award, the U.S. Artist Award in Architecture and Design, and the Rome Prize in Design. Eric Howler is a fellow of um, the AIA and an associate professor at the Harvard Graduate School of Design. He has more than 20 years of experience as a practitioner and um, before um, um, founding his practice with uh, Mi Jin, uh, Eric was an associate principal at KPF for um, seven years and was the senior designer on the um, ICC Tower here in Hong Kong. And previously, he was a senior designer at um, uh, Dillard's Cofidio uh, in New York. So um, without further ado, I would love to um, welcome um, Eric and Mijin um, to join us and give our, um, to give the talk tonight. Yeah, welcome. Thanks, Su Chang. Thanks, uh, AA Hong Kong. Um, we're delighted to be with you. Um, sorry, we can't be there in person. Uh, it's much more fun in person, obviously. Um, and we do find Hong Kong very familiar and it feels like home when we're in Hong Kong. So uh, we're sorry we're not there with you. Um, Su Chang asked us to talk about first projects, uh, which causes us to sort of reflect a little bit about uh, how we got here from there uh, and what happened along the way. So. This is um, some of the projects may be familiar, but we're going to talk about them slightly differently uh, in terms of like how one thing led to the other. The other thing we've been talking about is Verifying Field, which is the, the title of a new book that we've uh, just put out. And so uh, we're using verification as a way to think about the present moment. How do we sort of check and double check uh, what is the state of things today? And so uh, that term may come up a few times uh, in the lecture as well. Um, looking from 2022 backwards, um, I would say we're fortunate that we've been, you know, quite busy. Um, and uh, when I look at our Instagram, it's full of construction photos as opposed to renderings, which I think is a good sign. Um, but how the story began, I would say in 1989, um, I started at Cornell. Um, I'd been grown up in Southeast Asia, and so moving to Ithaca in upstate New York was kind of a shock. Uh, but it was a place where we sort of studied architecture quite quite intensely. Uh, Mijin also went to Cornell, so we met as undergrads in 
in, in the early 90s. Um, so we've known each other for quite a while. Cornell was a kind of formative part of our uh, design uh, story. Uh, this is a picture of Majin from 1991, uh, wearing her project on her head, um, which is maybe a good place for it. Do um, you want to say a little bit about your experience after you graduated? Sure. So, um, hi everyone. Great to great to be here. So, after I graduated from Cornell, I went on to do a master's um, a MAUD Urban Design degree at Harvard, um, and then after that, went to Korea, where I was born, and um, did a Fulbright research project on uh, the city. And then I returned to the US in New York City and began practice in a very small firm, um, Dean Wolf Architects at the time. It was two partners and two staff, uh, and I was one of the two staff, and worked mainly on um, uh, projects in New York City. And then I, after I graduated from Cornell, I went to work at KPF, um, where I was for seven years. Um, this is a photo of uh, Gene Cohn and Paul Katz and Tom Holtzman and myself. Uh, it had a kind of publicity uh, photo feel, but this is, uh, you know, the project team for Chater House, which I also worked on uh, in Hong Kong. Um, as Su Chang said, I did do the competition for ICC and I led this project for three or four years um, as uh, we took it from competition through design development. Um, this was probably the last project I worked on at KPF after having been there for a long time. And during this time, I think I made 39 trips to Hong Kong. So um, I did feel very much at home in Hong Kong because I spent so much time there. Um, as we worked on projects overseas, I did wonder like, what was the theory for this practice? It seemed like we were just sort of practicing, practicing, practicing. I was looking for theories of skyscrapers or tall buildings, theories of rapid urbanization. and I couldn't find any that I liked, so I decided to write a book uh, about tall buildings. And so I published in 2003 uh, a book called Skyscraper Vertical Now. Uh, and this is kind of a theme, I think, as we practice, we're also reflecting on practice. And so um, working on projects, but also writing about projects. Uh, in 2003, I joined Diller Scafidio uh, to work on the ICA Museum in Boston. Uh, this was their first building uh, being built. And so uh, I was happy to join an incredibly thoughtful academic practice uh, and sort of embark on this project of figuring out how to build a building, uh, but thinking about architecture in completely different ways. You know, for KPF, it was about how do we sort of um, do uh, the, the project um, in the most sort of refined and, and elegant way, uh, searching for something, um, you know, very precise. At Dillerska video, it was, it was less about the kind of artifact and more about the kind of discourse, I would say. And so uh, this building was sort of, um, in a way, kind of ungainly uh, from a sort of conventional aesthetic point of view, but produced architectural effects, like the kind of uh, the feeling of being under this massive cantilever, um, the kind of the perception of this surface sort of wrapping and folding. You know? So this was not about the same definition of architecture, the same pursuit of architecture, but incredibly um, powerful to be surrounded by by Liz and Rick and the people in the studio uh, for this project. Um, this project was built in 2005, uh, but in 2005, I left Diller Scafidio and joined Mijin, who had been working on her own in a studio called MY Studio. Yeah, so um, I, after working in New York for a few years, I had an opportunity to start teaching first at the University of Toronto, and then I took a tenure track position at MIT. And uh, when I started at MIT, because my education had been all analog, um, I was um, uh, anxious about joining a school of technology. So one of the things I did was I signed up for a course the first semester I was teaching, and that course was called How to Make Almost Anything. Uh, it was taught in the media lab, and it was basically a kind of uh, how-to course in the emerging technologies of the time, sensors, um, uh, shape memory alloys, um, and, and the like. And so uh, I created this defensible dress, which would respond to people encroaching on my personal space, like Eric, uh, and these 
these uh, spikes would go up if uh, somebody got closer to me than you know 18 inches. Um, and um, so that was like my first semester teaching and my, I wanted to be both a student and a teacher at the same time. Uh, a couple of years later, I had two great opportunities. Um, one was to collaborate with Enrique Norton on the Guggenheim Aztec Empire Show, uh, which um, exhibited 400 artifacts in the Guggenheim Museum and had the opportunity to design this uh, exhibition armature, which is this felt wall that undulates in and out to hold these artifacts. And you know, this was our first testing of using kind of parametric software because every artifact had a custom size and scale and then got smoothed out in this kind of interior ribbon wall. Uh, and I also had the opportunity to do a uh, an installation through a competition for the Athens Olympics. And this project was called White Noise, White Light. And it was an interactive responsive field uh, that people could walk through uh, in, in the old city. Um, and so at some point, I think I said to Eric, um, I'm going to have a practice. <laughs> and if you would like, you are welcome to join me, but you have to then leave Dillerska video. So that was the ultimatum. Yeah, I remember it a bit more sternly than that. Um, <laughs> but um, I did um, move to Boston and we started our practice in 2005. Um, we still were involved with publications. We were project editors on Praxis Magazine. And so um, in a way, keeping a kind of um, a writing practice, a kind of editorial practice going in parallel to our practice, I think has always been uh, important to us. Um, in 2005, we started our practice, Howler Plus Yoon architecture. Um, and this was uh, our apartment, which is still our office. And so uh, we sort of had an apartment space that we could sort of grow into an office. Um, our first website was, and looking back at this, it's so funny, it's like um, <laughs> little projects, little installations. We did the PS1 uh, competition in 2006, we designed furniture, there's the Guggenheim, there's white noise, white light. So this was our sort of first website uh, in 2005, uh, trying to position ourselves in the world. Um, when we looked at heroes, um, Charles and Ray Eames were an obvious model for us because they sort of had this incredible ability to work across different formats and in different contexts. Uh, someone once asked Charles, what are the limits of design? And he said, what are the limits of problems? And so this uh, represents a kind of expansive idea of design uh, that can take on you know, any, any challenge, whether it's furniture or um, you know, now we think about you know, furniture to climate change. Like how can we sort of have impact at, at every scale? Um, our, our office, this is our apartment. Um, and here we have, you know, five people lined up, um, and uh, this is a kind of uh, our publicity shot. Uh, so you see how neat it is, how the desks are organized. It's daytime; everyone's working hard. Uh, the reality is, it was total chaos. We were sewing, we were tearing things apart, we were building things, making sort of electronics, um, and our projects did have this kind of maker attitude, very much inspired by MIT. Uh, we would spend a lot of time soldering, you know, LEDs onto boards uh, and working with uh, computer scientists and music composers to uh, to design projects that were more ephemeral. Um, and at this point, we struggled to articulate a theory of this. We said media is a material for architecture. It's not just, you know, stone and steel and glass, but media, meaning information, responsiveness interactivity was a material for architecture. It was part of our expanded palette of architecture. At the same time, we were entering competitions. So in 2010, we entered a small competition for the Boston Society of Architects, which is the AIA in Boston. Um, this is for their new headquarters space. We imagined a, a ceiling that became a stair that became a billboard. And so if one thing could do three things, uh, that would seem to make a lot of sense. We won the competition and we built this, built this project. It's a steel plate stair you know, that's three quarters of an inch wide. And so uh, it sort of comes down from the ceiling and sort of scoops you up and brings you into the space. Um, this project was completed in 2010. Uh, and the competition, I was just telling Winston, was done the week after our daughter was born. So, you know, how do you balance uh, practice and life? Um, 
this is part of the struggle to balance practice and life. Um, and then this project in 2010 was published in Architectural Record, which is uh, nice. Uh, it is important, I think, to maintain a kind of um, a way of working that also lives almost separately uh, in media. So not just like interactive media, but also like printed media. Uh, and the kind of parallels between practice and media is another kind of theme that we like to sort of talk about. We also, um, in the first part of our practice, we had opportunities to design things like a house for some friends of Mijin's parents. Uh, and remember, I had worked on skyscrapers and museums. Mijin had worked on uh, electronics and interiors. So we had no idea how to build a house, um, which is kind of funny because most American practices, the first commission is like a house and sort of that's like their entryway into architecture. Uh, we sort of came at the house not knowing how to do a house, no experience with the house. Uh, this house was unique in that it had this beautiful landscape in front of it. And so the house was sort of uh, open all the way through. And we talked about framing, framing of the landscape. You know, the house is really just a kind of, it's a frame for looking at the landscape. And I would say like the first chapter of our practice sort of um, was marked by the publication of this book, Expanded Practice in 20. Uh, 10, um, really sort of trying to look back at a series of projects that we'd done in five years, um, many of them uh, self-initiated, like the defensible dress, many of them sort of testing the boundaries of what architecture was by going into uh, wearables, going into electronics, uh, experimenting with landscape. But we argue that these were all architectural projects, even the defensible dress is about space, personal space, uh, public space. Uh, and so these were all architectures in our minds. Um, fast forward to today, I think we just released this book, Verify and Field. You know, so the last 12 years, um, we sort of, now we're looking back from 2022, looking back all the way to 2010, uh, and how have we sort of changed the way we think about architecture and what kind of things are we doing? Um, so in this lecture, I wanted to sort of put the two books back to back, even though they're separated by 12 years. And, uh, the first half is like building up to the book, and then the second half is sort of building back from the second book, and we'll see if that works. Um, a few years ago, I was asked, like, where does work come from? And I did this drawing to try to understand. So um, we just finished the MIT Museum. Um, we worked on a project called Stewart Street, which I'll show you in a minute. Uh, and I asked, where did the MIT Museum come from? You know, how did we get to know them? How did they find us? And so we did a small project for MIT before. Um, and the Boston Society of Architects had a kind of gallery component, right? And so if I track back from MIT Museum to MIT to Boston Society of Architects to the Guggenheim exhibition that Mijin showed or to the ICA Museum that I did at Diller Skip Video, there's there's a line that connects these projects, right? Experiences, relationships, um, consultants. Um, and then Stewart Street, which is a, a tower that we just completed, uh, led to a number of other things. But I think it's easy to draw the line straight back to a project we did for Millennium uh, and straight back to say the ICC tower in Hong Kong to say um, the tower was a typology that was familiar, you know, to do a tower in Hong Kong at KPF to work on a tower here in Boston, to do a tower here in Boston. Like those are direct lines that I think we could track back. But I did this for all of our projects uh, and very interesting to think about, you know, Majin's experience at Dean Wolf Architects uh, leading to a loft project, leading to another residential project, leading to, to other things. So I encourage everyone who's practicing to try to do a drawing like this, to figure out what projects you're working on today and then how they related to previous um, practices, previous projects, um, and figure out what those lines are. Sometimes they're implicit and sometimes they form clusters. So these are kind of clusters of projects that have to do with institutions, clusters of projects that have to do with public space. Um, it's, it's a fun exercise and um, it might reveal something about uh, how you work and, and, uh, and what those networks are. Do you want to say something about this one? No? Okay. Um, so this is the second half of the presentation. So starting with Stewart Street, as I mentioned, it's a residential tower in Boston. I just saw it yesterday. Um, and it's in a beautiful historic neighborhood uh, called Bay Village. Uh, this is a project that um, we spent about five years 
uh, trying to get permission to do it because Bay Village is a historic or, or landmark neighborhood in Boston. This is the district and the towers right here on the edge. Um, this is some of the fabric of Bay Village. You see these beautiful two-story brick buildings and then some taller limestone buildings. Uh, we did a kind of survey of the materials and details and said maybe we can build our building out of these types of materials, uh, some ironwork, some limestone, you know, some classical details, some you know, stone and brick. Um, and so when we started, we tried to um, imagine like what could a tower be in this part of the city where the context is really two and three story buildings on one side and then the other side is like taller uh, 20 story buildings on the other. Um, and so we sort of embarked on a process of sort of building uh, lots of study models trying to imagine what does residential architecture look like in Hong Kong, uh, sorry, in Boston. Um, and I, I see some of the models are actually still sort of hanging out here behind us. So model building and testing versions of things is still very much part of our process. Uh, so we started with the monolith and we sort of broke it in half and then we sheared it and then sort of subdivided it into these sort of irregular courses. Um, and then this one seemed to be interesting because it takes two stories and then three stories and then four stories, uh, five and six and sort of attenuates as it gets taller. Um, and then how do we sort of articulate this? We tried to imagine a kind of construction process with these multi-story panels that would go up quickly and sort of enclose the building uh, in these fluted piers. Uh, so we made these plaster casts very early on and we sort of brought them to our first meetings. Uh, and then we started working with limestone and showing clients these limestone uh, fluted piers. Um, eventually, uh, we proposed uh, precast concrete as the solution. Um, and these were studies done just to show what it would feel like from the, from the historic neighborhood, uh, these sort of large, uh, largely opaque fluted piers. Um, one of the lessons we learned was that this building participates on two streets, on Stewart Street, which is more commercial, and Shawmut Street, which is a small residential street. These are the neighbors in two-story brownstone buildings. They have stoops. They have, you know, planter boxes with flowers. All these neighbors know each other. This used to be a parking lot. And so they used to look at a parking lot. And we said, no, you're not going to look at a parking lot. You're going to look at neighbors. And so we turned the building around. We have two townhouses that have stoops, that have flower boxes. And so rather than look at the back of the building with the loading dock or mechanical units, they're looking at neighbors. And so this was a story that the building has fronts and backs, but it also creates two sides of the street. And so these neighbors will look at other neighbors. Uh, they're not looking at the back of, of a building. And that was essential to get their support in terms of getting this building approved in this historic neighborhood. Uh, this is the rendering. Uh, we show the city um, looking up at the, at the scallop panels. We said, Boston's not about this style or that style. It's really about qualities, you know, things that are um, well built, that are thick, that cast shadows. Um, and so when we proposed to the owner that we would make these precast panels, we said, we really want depth. We want the light to move across the building. Uh, and so we were sort of looking at these um, foam mock-ups to see how, how this would behave in the light and how this would affect the views. Uh, we love um, not just getting our hands dirty, but also seeing how things are made. So visiting the precast fabricator uh, to understand these three-story molds. How do we optimize the number of molds? How do we sort of vary the molds to produce uh, a kind of richness in expression? I think these are quite beautiful in terms of, of sculpture uh, and almost defining these uh, sort of shapes in between uh, or implied shapes you know, that the building sort of produces. Uh, incredibly beautiful sort of gaps between these precast panels. And so with a kind of set of parts, how do we sort of produce a kind of whole? Um, how do we vary the parts uh, and how do we sort of uh, assemble them to produce the, the kind of stacked, uh, what I would call coursed, uh, varied uh, building? Uh, we're fascinated by the kind of construction sequence, how these things are installed and in a way, the learning process of understanding that um, these multi-story panels will accelerate the speed of construction on some level um, because they go quite fast. On the other hand, they, they produce you know, gravity loads on every third floor, which makes the structural design of the slabs more challenging. So 
uh, something that seemed like a good idea um, actually produced all kinds of headaches in terms of coordination. So I think that's why we practice is because we want to we want to learn. Um, I think this is you know fascinating to see uh, a kind of construction process, but also taking the process into the design process. And so you can't design this building without imagining how it will be assembled and by whom. And so those are, I think, questions that sort of guide us as we start thinking about um, design uh, today, not just form and material, but but labor and, and uh, skill and, and technique. Increasingly, I think these things are starting to enter into the conversation in our studio. Maybe one of our first uh, ground up architectural projects um, uh, it took us to actually uh, China. And so our first opportunity to build at any scale uh, came from um, a collaboration between many architects. And um, one of them suggested that we join this, this group. Uh, and the project um, came to us via email. And it was an email I actually ignored because um, it just didn't seem real. Uh, and so I think the email came twice or three times, was ignored all three times. Please don't email me because clearly I'm not very responsive to emails. Um, but um, uh, so people know that. So actually someone picked up the phone and said, did you see that we are, you know, um, inviting you to participate in this in this architectural project in Chengdu. And um, the premise was based on uh, developing out of a kind of courtyard house typology. And this was presented by the client, a kind of recuperation of some of the qualities uh, present in um, kind of historic um, uh, uh, structures, such as the courtyard house, which really Privilege the gardens and one that introduced the kind of landscape and architecture relationship. Um, and so we went to the first meeting and all these young architects uh, who had the exact same brief arrived together and we put all our models together. And this is the train wreck uh, that was the outcome of many young architects ambitions around what a interpretation of the historic Chinese courthouse could be uh, in, in a different program. And so this was a kind of cultural program of a series of exhibition halls. And so the client was really amazing in that he did not fire all of us, which I think he was very tempted to just fire all of us, but instead he actually, um, did what we as educators do uh, and uh, gave us a critique and then sent us to actually learn from the contact. So he sent us to the Suzhou Gardens um, where we uh, learned not from a top-down plan, the kind of spatial organization, but really through the experience and through the kind of sequence of the relationship between uh, architecture and the garden and these in-between architectures as well. Um, and then he sent us to the Erme Mountains. And so at the crack of dawn, uh, Eric and his colleagues uh, marched up the mountain to see this uh, vista. And the comment that was shared uh, to us was, this is quote unquote Chinese feeling. And this is what we need to try to capture in the design of the project. And so we began again. Um, uh, we simplified the organization and the form. Uh, we packed a series of courtyards together. Um, and then we used that logic of the kind of packing to um, uh, moderate and mediate the elevations on all of the facades because it's a quite uh, uh, opaque building. Um, and uh, then, you know, after we issued the drawings, um, there was a long pause and uh, maybe, you know, a year later, we got a, another email, uh, which we did open, which said, ah, we've started construction on the project. Uh, and could you please, uh, architects, um, uh, mirror your building, the site has changed, you know, um, we need you to flip the building around and you have really very little time. So instead of having the time to do another full set of drawings, we're actually sending Rhino models back and forth with the client 
uh, and his team to coordinate the structure um, and the um, materials and the envelope. And so the final outcome of the project uses local brick. And so you see this kind of darkening of the brick as you move up the elevation of the building. Uh, and that was simply an outcome of over time, the bricks in the um, uh, manufacturing um, uh, process got, got darker because it's such a um, large amount of small masonry units. And then the windows are also very small and operable. Um, and uh, so we created these core 10 steel window surrounds. And originally we had designed them in wood, but we learned in that context, it was actually more affordable uh, and more sustainable to, to use this recycled core 10 steel. Um, so this was a really um, important project, I think for us in terms of kind of a different scale, uh, exploring the kind of brick um, as a unit and um, working with really the kind of masonry craft of how we could turn the kind of local brick into a real um, quality for the building. So because uh, we didn't want to create complex drawings that would um, uh, create, you know, um, things that were hard to coordinate in the construction process. We actually, for the masonry unit, said conceptually we would think of it as um, a compass, uh, that every brick would be oriented true north-south or east-west, which meant on the oblique angles of the building, we would still maintain the brick's uh, face as true north-south or east-west, which would create this kind of serrated texture to the brick. So this is a moment where the building uh, angles. This is a end of uh, um, uh, one side of the building, which is also at an angle. So all of the oblique angles of the building uh, create this kind of great, uh, beautiful texture, which helps one orient oneself around the site. And I think the greatest compliment uh, was at the end of the project where the client said, you somehow captured the Chinese feeling, quote unquote, that uh, he was looking for. Okay, um, we're fortunate to, to still have work in China. This is a small project we did uh, with Kerry Properties in uh, Shanghai in Shenzhen, just over the border. Um, this is a, a project for a, um, a cafe, an uh, event space uh, in a small park uh, surrounded by uh, larger buildings, uh, all of them designed by KPF. Um, our proposal was to sort of create a shade pavilion. Uh, we understand that in, in a hot climate, shade is a way to make place. And so our premise was we have a very generous canopy uh, and a very small footprint building. Uh, so that was the, the concept. Uh, as we sort of developed the drawings for the, for the canopy and doing renderings, really thinking about the sun and the kind of, um, the kind of intense uh, heat uh, in, and so this idea of like um, responding to the sun, I think became quite important. Uh, these are some sections, you know, showing this sort of, um, this sort of shade uh, trellis uh, that produces a kind of, uh, in a way, a kind of umbrella for the building. Um, how do you get a glass building that wants to be transparent to the park, but also not create all kinds of questions of, of cooling and comfort. And so creating in a way an architecture for the architecture uh, sort of mitigates the sort of impact of the sun before it reaches the building. Uh, we did a number of studies uh, for the actual um, shade elements, you know, starting with, you know, parallelograms, and we looked at these kind of airfoil shapes. Um, these seem to sort of relate to a different kind of tradition, maybe a kind of aeronautical tradition. And we said, what if this became not just about um, wind but about light and how does it bounce light in the space uh, between these panels and so uh, we did some uh, sort of uh, simulations with software to sort of look at the the effect of the shaping of the of the of the extrusions um, and then you know without the shade you know what is the self-shading provided by the adjacent buildings and then how might um, the geometry of the profile actually affect the quality of light and so here you see the concave profile sort of bounces light in between. 
uh, and produces a kind of luminosity without the, the kind of um, heat. Whereas this one, you know, blocks a lot of direct light, but also creates a kind of dark underside. Like I said, how can we think about this as a kind of luminous ceiling that doesn't produce that heat? And so these are some sort of simulations showing like rays uh, moving sort of between these concave surfaces. Um, and again, we were thinking like, how much of this are we producing and could we do a custom extrusion? If we propose this in the States, I think our clients would sort of say you're crazy, but I think in the context of China, I think saying I'm gonna do a custom die because I'm doing like five kilometers of extrusions isn't so unusual. And so uh, we sort of propose that these louvers be custom profiled, that they respond to the sun, that they produce a kind of diaphanous sort of lighting effect. Um, and, and our client uh, was, was responsive to this. And so uh, <laughs> we did a custom die. We tried uh, some, this is a first sort of attempt at the extrusion. Uh, they eventually got it right and produced, I think, beautiful sort of large, you know, cross sections with concave profiles. Um, and they do sort of soften the light that comes through. I was reminded of the, um, the Manil Gallery in Houston by Renzo Piano that uses the same kind of concavity uh, to create a kind of very soft sort of museum quality light. And so uh, the project was completed. These are kind of old sort of still in construction shots, but you see the orientation of these different panels because they're responding to the actual uh, light that's um, hitting each of these panels. So it's very much tailored to the specifics of its context. Um, and so here we're starting to think about not just form, but form informed by climate or form informed by um, simulations that do change the perception of, of phenomena like, like sunlight uh, in the service of a kind of um, placemaking strategy uh, for, for this context. Um, we still do a number of projects in China. Uh, a couple of years ago, we were asked to compete for a pedestrian bridge in Shanghai, the site of the former expo. So 2010, you know, we had both Heatherwick Seed Cathedral and, and this sort of strange um, sort of uh, inverted pyramid. Uh, one, I would say, looking back at history, the other sort of looking forward, um, both of them sort of grappling with you know, how do you build in China today in ways that are thoughtful uh, and, and hopefully uh, productive. So this is the expo park in Shanghai. Uh, Maybe you were there for the expo. There are a series of artificial lakes that's being converted into a people's park. Um, the competition asked for two bridges uh, to span across this artificial lake. Um, we, because we had been thinking about, you know, um, the Suzhou uh, Gardens for the Chengdu project, uh, because we thought a lot about what is unique to Chinese space and, and experience of space, uh, we came into the competition thinking. Uh, the architecture is not about these buildings or even these geometries. It's about relationships between people in the landscape. And so I think uh, being able to describe um, these conditions, not simply in terms of form and material, but actually in terms of relationships and views, I think was important. Um, instead of producing two bridges in parallel, we said maybe it's one bridge with an opening in the middle. You know, maybe it's a, a way to frame the water. Uh, and I think that sort of appealed to the jury um, that it wasn't just about getting from A to B, but it was actually about being in between A and B and having vistas across from here to here. And so this was um, part of our sort of pitch, this idea of these uh, two bridges or one bridge that frames the water uh, with these sort of circular cutouts uh, that are designed to frame the landscape, but also set up these relationships across the landscape. Um, and so I think this represents, you know, some amount of, um, of experience and, and learning in a way from working in different contexts, you know, how to think about um, relationships. Uh, what does it mean in a Chinese context to be in the landscape? What does it mean to be over the water? What does it mean to be uh, observing the kind of reflections uh, in the water? Um, and how does the bridge become a destination? You know, so a kind of um, a kind of a place to be, not just a, a, a place to cross. Um, oops. So, um, you know, the obvious sort of references are, you know, a lot of the kind of playful 
um, and surprising uh, framing devices within some of these traditional spaces. Um, and this is the, the proposal was to sort of create this almost boat like shape in concrete and then to line it with the pavers, the pavers then sort of wrap up and become a kind of textured surface uh, on the edge. And so here uh, we're sort of testing how do we work between a, a smooth exterior and a kind of textured interior. Um, and, you know, um, in China, you don't always know that you've won a competition. <laughs> Um, I think uh, we were congratulated and then didn't hear from the client for a while. Um, and then it turns out they were building it and then they asked us for help because they had trouble getting it, um, getting it approved. So uh, we sort of came back to the project and worked with them to, to work out some of the, uh, the geometry. Obviously this is a complex form, it's curved in both directions, the torus geometry, uh, the formwork for the torus, uh, the sort of uh, working out the masonry uh, these are not CMU blocks, these are granite blocks. How does the texture meet the smoothness of the concrete? Um, how does the underbelly uh, get sort of experienced? Uh, and the amazing thing is that, uh, you know, when there's a will, there's a way. And um, oftentimes um, projects in China move quite, quite fast. And so uh, this project has, has been completed. We haven't seen it, uh, unfortunately, uh, because of COVID, we haven't been able to go. Um, it's not exactly as we designed it. <laughs> um, you know, in China, sometimes it's not less is more, it's like more or less. So it's like more or less the way we designed it. Like these parts are, you know, they added these other circles and this one I really wish hadn't been added because it, it really takes away from the experience of this as a, as a single bridge with an opening in it. But, but that's sort of the way it goes. Um, and I think we're, we're grateful to have opportunities to work um, in these contexts. Um, Su Cheng, how are we doing on time? Should we sort of wind it down? I feel like um, maybe it's it's getting late there. Yeah, I think we are. I don't know how, how many slides you have left. Um, We've got tons of slides, but um, yeah, we just maybe UVA. maybe one last project. We'll just uh, jump to one last project and and uh, and then we'll open it up for discussion. Um, I, I always want to share lots of stuff that we're working on, um, but. Um, We'll jump to UVA, which I think is our most recent, um, most significant project of recent memory. Uh, and and why don't you talk about it? Great. Uh, so um, for those of you that know, uh, University of Virginia is a, a very um, historically significant campus. It kind of represents what uh, higher education uh, meant at the beginning of the um, establishment of the United States. And so this notion of democracy and education and the relationship between those two um, somehow is embedded in the history of the architecture at the University of Virginia. And uh, Thomas Jefferson, who founded the university, was also the third president of the United States, uh, a kind of architect, as well as, of course, a legislator and uh, leader, but he was also the owner of 400 enslaved individuals uh, at the time. And so he uh, has this complex history uh, within the United States as both a kind of uh, president, of the, um, founder of the president of a country, founder of the university, and also a slave owner. And so the United States has been reckoning with this kind of history of slavery uh, that is really embedded in its founding and particularly uh, uh, present in the Southern, Southern colonies. And so if you look at the, um, even the way the university conveys its own history, uh, such as this um, important plaque in the street, it, um, um, celebrates Thomas Jefferson, talks about the um, university campus as a World Heritage Site, and on this plaque there's no mention, of course, of the uh, 4,000 enslaved people um, who uh, made the university uh, possible and built the university through back-breaking labor. Um, uh, there's been, um, uh, of recent years, a lot of controversy around uh, monuments and memorials, and so this is the Robert E. Lee statue. So as we were working uh, on the memorial for enslaved laborers, 
um, which is the official uh, name of the project, um, it was a time when uh, uh, the city of downtown Charlottesville was um, discussing the removal of the Robert E. Lee statue um, because of its kind of Confederate um, history. Um, but it was then also the re reason it became a flashpoint site uh, for the uh, Unite the Right rally um, and the kind of supremacist white nationalists who uh, arrived in Charlottesville. And, um, and uh, there was a, a tragedy, Heather Hare, in that uh, set of um, uh, rallies was actually killed. Uh, by a white nationalist, um, and there was a, a vigil at the University of uh, Virginia to come together and to heal around this uh, act of violence and um, tragedy. So that was the context at the time we were working on the Memorial for Enslaved Laborers. And what's interesting is um, this very beautiful historic um, representation of the academical village, which has the rotunda on axis and the pavilions which flank it with a colonnade. Um, and uh, you'll see that uh, in the left corner, this uh, is the first uh, representation um, of a black enslaved woman and here taking care of you know, a white child, so a master's uh, child. Uh, so um, the way the um, architecture and the landscape work in the academical village is that it is used masterfully to um, use the section <clears throat> to hide certain things. And so um, the lower level, uh, which was a kind of walkout level uh, in section to a lower landscape, um, were the kind of working gardens where the enslaved would um, do their kind of uh, cooking and cleaning and, and the kind of the labor aspect that was needed to make the university uh, function. And so um, uh, the students at the University of Virginia through both like research projects and thesis projects, um, brought forward the a lack of acknowledgement in UVA's um, verbal history and signage history and um, the way they tell the story of the founding of the university that um, the history of uh, slavery had been kind of um, washed away or obscured and brought forward um, uh, the need to make this acknowledgement. Um, the University of Virginia did acknowledge that um, uh, enslaved labor was used, um, but the way they did that was in this kind of plaque that was in the ground near the rotunda, which again celebrated Thomas Jefferson, who designed the University of Virginia. And um, the students felt and the faculty felt and that this was not the proper acknowledgement of the um, enslaved laborers and the history of slavery that um, uh, at, at the university. Also, um, very shortly thereafter, they discovered a, um, a cemetery behind the official university cemetery of um, uh, enslaved remains. Uh, and that also brought to fore this uh, history that really needed to be acknowledged by the university. So we work collaboratively with a um, amazing team, um, Mabel Wilson, Frank Dukes, Eto Otetigbe, Greg Bleem, um, uh, on a kind of long, um, a long kind of process by which we engage the community and not just the UVA community, but the Charlottesville community to talk about and uh, develop a proposal for a memorial uh, to enslaved laborers, which is a title that was designated and given actually by the students. Um, and um, it was a uh, 
unusual, I think, to work as a collaborative design team with a kind of historian, as well as a kind of environmental engagement uh, expert and a landscape architect and an artist. Uh, we had a series of um, meetings with all, uh, in various different locations uh, with the community and extended community to not only learn about this history, but also think about how we convey this history. Um, and what was really important and we uh, heard from the communities was that it really needed to be a place to gather to not only recognize the history of slavery, but to continue the work of racial justice today. Uh, and um, annually, um, the, the community marches between the slave auction block and, and, um, and the city to uh, campus. And this concept of let freedom ring uh, became quite resonant with the development of the memorial, as did these cultural rituals. This one's called a ring shout, where uh, people gather in a kind of circle and dance kind of counterclockwise as a form of um, uh, celebration and kind of cathartic um, uh, declaration. And so the conclusion was the project had to bring people together, this form of the ring shout or a community coming together uh, in a circle um, uh, drove the form uh, because it could uh, both have, um, it could uh, define a space for, for people to gather. So the memorial is simply this kind of land form um, that has a series of inner rings and outer rings uh, that creates a gathering space uh, in the middle. Um, and it's also based on this concept of a clearing or a hush harbor, that there was a clearing in the forest where the enslaved gathered um, away from the gaze and the uh, retribution of the masters. And so the memorial sits um, in relationship to the rotunda, but where the rotunda is this kind of closed sphere, the memorial is actually this kind of open landform uh, that's uh, uh, more like a cone than a sphere. Um, and it's uh, graded as part, or it's kind of embedded into a sloping hill uh, and um, uh, is scaled to really modulate with the human body. So uh, you move into the ring and slowly as you walk around the inside perimeter, you lose the horizon line and you are kind of embedded in this landscape and confronted with this wall. And so this is a mock-up of the section. Uh, it's made of um, local Virginia mist uh, granite. Um, and uh, what was really important about the materiality was that it would bring together the kind of cultural material legacy uh, in terms of these kind of gravestones um, in the nearby cemetery, but that uh, we were asked to really bring forward a, a more representational aspect of this history. Um, and this is when we reached out to Eto Otutigbe, who's an artist, uh, and asked him to work with us because we saw this extraordinary work of his um, called Becoming <clears throat> Visible. And so we, we um, struggled with how we could represent uh, enslaved people at the time, and there were many suggestions from the community, but we thought any pictorial representation would be um, uh, just hard, you know, to to produce. And so we went back to um, one of the protagonists, which is Isabella uh, Gibbons, who's, um, uh, this is a portrait and a kind of zoom in on her eyes. And Isabella Gibbons was an enslaved woman who became free and stayed in the community and became a teacher um, in the community. And um, <laughs> This is a little mock-up of how this kind of technique of um, 
kind of carving the stone in a very specific way uh, using this V groove technique allows you to the eyes, Isabella's eyes, to come into um, uh, perspective only from kind of particular angles. And so we did a series of mock ups that um, brought both the kind of texture we were looking from the gouge uh, cemetery stones and the refined uh, texture of the eyes uh, together. And so this is uh, the outer surface of the memorial, which has um, those layered um, techniques that brings the eyes into visibility at a kind of colossal scale. And, and so Isabella um, is um, uh, the watcher and the witness over, over the site. Um, and then the other aspect is the inner wall, which has um, the four, we had to figure out how to represent the 4,000 enslaved individuals uh, on the memorial. But the challenge was in fact that, um, sorry, the challenge was that not all the names are known. Um, so um, often, even though there are meticulous records, they're recorded as the actual labor performed. Uh, and so we only know, you know, a subset of actual names um, and sometimes the labor and sometimes kinship. And so the strategy was to create this kind of um, genealogical cloud, which had first names if we knew them, first and second if we did, or occupation. Um, and so these are inscribed. And where we don't have a name, we left just what we call a memory mark. And so the memory marks are these like crescent grooves that are lines that carve in so that we have 4,000 of these lines. Uh, and where we know a name or a kinship, we place it. Um, but these lines are actually not a straight line. They actually have both a curve in, um, in a section and in plan, which captures the water after it rains. And so it holds the water a little bit longer. And so when the stone around uh, dries, the um, memory marks still cry or um, bleed with water. And I think this is just a section to share the, um, um, the affinity or the proximity or the precision of the kind of rendered um, uh, design and the, or the model design and then the actual design and the kind of precision needed to bring these conical geometries uh, together. And then this was um, the gathering and uh, the construction process and then the actual dedication. So um, as we were finishing this project, um, you know, COVID hit and um, COVID and then uh, the murder of George Floyd. And so, as you know, the murder of George Floyd, the anniversary just passed a few days ago, but uh, it sparked an incredible um, response in the United States um, uh, to protest the kind of brutality uh, that is exerted on African Americans every day. Um, and the memorial became a place where people would come and take a knee, you know, this act of protest, taking a knee to protest police brutality. Uh, people came individually to the memorial to take a knee. Uh, they came in small groups uh, to take a knee. Uh, the memorial is right by the University of Virginia Medical School. And so doctors and nurses would come and students would come and take a knee in the memorial. And then it became a place where, where people really gathered to, um, to, you know, uh, to mem memorialize George Floyd in the present, to think about this history of structural racism in the past, but also to try to create some action in the present. And I think this is what really struck us is how can we make places that resonate, that sort of reveal histories, but also resonate in the present. Um, you know, the George Floyd murders, uh, and the kind of structural racism that allowed for slavery to happen in the first place, these have not receded. These are still very much present in, in daily life in, in the US. And so 
we were struck by these photos of the memorial sort of acting as a kind of platform for this kind of collective activity. Um, and this is in a way unanticipated, this could not have been designed, but I think it's it sort of happened at, at the moment where this country was sort of reckoning with its history in real ways, material ways, architectural ways, may through the memorial, but also creating a place for people to gather. So like, what's the function of architecture? What's the function of public space? These are the questions that this project raised. Um, recently, more names have been discovered, which is interesting because we said this project can never be completed because there's a kind of unknowability to it. Uh, but recently additional names were added to these blanks. And so the blank is a kind of an open-ended acknowledgement of both the erasure of history, but also the possibility of future scholarship revealing new names. And so this is, I think, in a way, a kind of very uplifting uh, way to think about um, what can architecture do and how do we sort of deal with histories. I added this quote here by Herbert Simon. He says, science is the study of the world as it is, but design is a study of the world as it ought to be, which is kind of a wonderful way to think about design. How can we think about design sort of producing alternative worlds, better worlds, you know, worlds that are worthy of, of uh, for, our, for us and for our future generations. So maybe with that, we should sort of stop and have a moment of, of discussion um, with, uh, with you guys. We'd love to hear your thoughts. Thank you so much. Thank you, um, Eric and Eugene, for not only sharing the projects, but also like how you um, thought about them before, during, or maybe after the projects. And I think that's really wonderful to hear. Um, so I'm gonna welcome Winston Yu to join us and to um, for discussion. Also, maybe later to moderate the, the Q and A. Winston is um, our immediate past president at LAA Hong Kong and also um, operating a practice here um, with. Um, uh, his partner here in Hong Kong. Yeah, Winston. Thank you, Su Chang. Thank you, um, Eric and Mijin. In preparation for tonight, I've actually looked up a lot of the videos and past interviews, and um, it's incredible. I'm still, in, I'm very touched by the work. You know, hearing hearing it live, especially the last piece, the the, the showing that the 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 possibility or the potential for architecture to be a place of healing, of dealing with you know how we find ourselves in the world today. Um, and your work is is profound in, in a way that it's familiar. I, there are certain parts of it that resonates, you know, what we study at Cornell, um, Hadrian's Villa, the spatial armatures, but it's cast in a new light. Um, you're, you're almost both the architect, but also the craftsman, the technologist. Um, it's, it's really so special. So thank you for a beautiful presentation. Um, now, I'm going to try and do my best to, to join some of these questions because I know it's getting late. Um, Nelson Chen, uh, William Lim, and uh, Jason Pandey, re relates to your role as both a practitioner and as an educator. And I think Nelson puts it really nicely. Um, do you see yourselves as professor who practice or as architectural practitioners who are also professors? Does that matter? Does one activity inform the other? And William adds to that, is, does it make you more critical of your own work? Yeah, I think it's such an excellent question. Eric and I talk about that all the time. I think it does make us more critical um, as practitioners, makes us much more critical about our own work. And I think what we learned even as students, right, is that um, criticism is so important to move work forward. Um, but sometimes criticism can be almost paralyzing, right? Because we can be so critical of um, our own work or you know, the discipline uh, that it's almost paralyzing. And so we try to work both with each other, um, uh, but also with the mindset that, um, that there is a way forward that um, we can't just put our arms up in kind of defeat because we can um, criticize almost any action by any architect, right? That consumes any material, needs any labor, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, especially with climate change, you know, how do we uh, build in a really sustainable way, in a really equitable way that actually is a contribution to society and humanity uh, as opposed to um, 
uh, producing more more things that will be wasted <laughs> um, wasted in the world. So uh, we often say like um, uh, teaching makes us better practitioners and practicing makes us better teachers. And, and, and perhaps I suppose teach your your body of work deals with issues and challenges and uncertainties at the moment, but teaching is teaching a next generation um, of, of practitioners. So it's it's almost looking further into the future. And on that note, how would you how would you think how do you think about the the role of, of teaching or, or of academia? Um, whereas in the past, you know, students went to school to learn a specific skill set and to perform a particular role in society. But increasingly, we find that, you know, you are, we're stepping into the unknown, you're going to school for a variable in X. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think, you know, I, I think education shifted from teaching skills to actually teaching um, ways of engaging in inquiry, you know, design inquiry, uh, it's more about the process. And I think for all of us who are practicing today, we reflect on our, um, how we were educated and what we take from it is more, I think, what we learned about how to develop a concept, a critical idea. It's a, it's a really um, more about a methodology uh, than I think it is about like a particular software or a particular technique. Um, though I do think there is true knowledge that needs, uh, that does need to be learned. Um, uh, but education is always evolving. And that's why in academia, there is a very active research and scholarship uh, set of activities. And I think practice plays into that. Practice creates new knowledge that then goes back into the academy. And there's knowledge in the academy that goes out into practice. Yeah, I'd say also in our office, we try to keep it uh, like a studio context. We try to have our office behave like a studio. It's not like I do a sketch and I hand it to someone and they sort of, you know, execute it, right? We meet with our team, we pin up things, we talk about it, sometimes we argue about it. And, and then the best ideas come forward and it's not clear whose ideas they were. That's the success of a good charrette is like, who came up with that thing? I don't know, but it was a good idea. And then someone took it forward and someone took it even forward. You know, yesterday we had a process in the office where you know everyone developed a scheme and then they handed it to the person on the left. And then you were developing someone else's scheme. And so it's not like my scheme or your scheme. It's like, we need to develop these things together. So how do we find authorship as something that is collective? How do we sort of all invest in something to make it the best possible version of it? Um, we're still experimenting with that, but I think certainly teaching makes us nimble uh, in practice uh, and keeps us away from from forming habits that might might sort of you know get Be unchallenged. <laughs> and um, how do you how do you balance your time? I mean, we I asked you this a little bit earlier on. You know, in addition to being writers, academics, academias, um, practitioners, you also have a family with a young child, right? How do you, where do you find the time and how do you, do you, is it by design? Do you design this is how much time I'm going to spend on each item or do you just, is it messy? It's certainly messy. I mean, I think, you know, we started at eight as opposed to 730 because I was dropping Kaya at the bus. So uh, that's one of my uh, most anticipated things is I love spending time with her. Walking to the bus, we have wonderful conversations and and I wouldn't trade that for the world, you know? And so, um, you know, making time for, for family is so important. Um, I think things inform each other. Like she has observations on the world that, that inform me as a, as a human. Um, and, I, and I'm an architect, a human architect. And, and, you know, someone said, are you reading that book for pleasure or for work? And I'm like, What's the difference? I'm reading the book to inform me as a human so that as an architect, I make better architecture, um, whether it's science fiction or, or a technical book, um, they all sort of end up sort of in there. So we really don't separate those things. I think if we think of ourselves as, as humanists, I think everything informs us as humans. And, and I have noticed that in your, in your talks, in your past talks, in every talk, the 
the order and the logic is, is always slightly different. You don't go, you don't show projects chronologically. I've been trying to map it and, and I can't map it, but what I can map is the consistency and themes across all the projects. So it really does seem that you are able to keep, you know, things that matter to you alive in, in each project. And it's just incredible to see that. Um, a, a question from the audience is, you know, how has COVID obviously has impacted all of us, but how has COVID impacted your particular practice? I think I want to expand that a little bit. Earlier on, I, I remember in one of the interviews you had mentioned, you know, increasingly you, you had started out with the idea of working in a global sort of environment and you had this tendency uh, wanting to work closer to home and I tracking the projects I do see that then it seems you guys are being very busy lately and you know a lot of projects are springing back up in Asia. So have, have your attitude towards working globally changed uh, and how is COVID helping or challenging that? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think growing up in Asia, you know, I wanted to work in Asia. And so when I graduated, I went to KPF because KPF was working in Asia. That was kind of interesting to me. Um, so Asia never felt that far. It always felt like going home, actually. Um, so that's that's a kind of interest. Um, I think I'm also intrigued by the challenge of, of history in Asia. It's different in China. It's different in Thailand. It's different in Korea. You know, how do we sort of find ways to create meaningful contributions that are contemporary, but also resonate with the sort of uh, culture and, and history? Uh, so it's it's had some wonderful, wonderful challenges, I think, working internationally. Um, because we were working globally, we were already on Zoom, even before the pandemic, we were doing, you know, when I was at KPF, we did a conference call with Hong Kong, you know, once a week. And at the end of every night, we put all our drawings in a fax machine. And every morning there was a new pile of faxes to look at. So thinking globally has always been part of our process. Um, this desire to work closer to home, I think certainly having a family makes it harder to travel long distances for, for days at a time. So um, I think finding the right balance, but I think we've somehow managed to, to grow our firm. We have 34 employees um, mm -hmm. and a number of, of um, you know, uh, very capable associates and senior associates who are able to run projects, um, you know. And so I think we're very uh, lucky to have a structure in the office that can function, allowing us to be more um, still involved with all the projects, um, still engaged intellectually and, and benefiting from the kind of uh, nourishment of ideas, um, but able to do work um, in different parts of the world while still being home for dinner. And, and that's kind of uh, an incredible uh, jujitsu uh, to imagine being able to do it all, um, all simultaneously. Um, I, I don't know if we've figured out the kind of magical formula, but, but somehow it seems to be working. I actually have a question just to, you know, follow up on that. You, you know, you work on, you know, projects now in so many different contexts, um, so many different scales. And actually looking back at some of the earlier works, some of the first projects, they're also very diverse in terms of um, the kind of typologies and, and scales. Um, but we're also in a world that's, you know, increasingly looking for you know, expertise and specialties, although we all care about a lot of different things um, and have a lot of interest. So how do we balance that, you know, um, diversity and, you know, all the interest we have versus the kind of extra expertise we need to you know, horn to, yeah. Yeah, I, I think one of the um, greatest things or qualities about architects and architecture maybe architects, is that uh, fundamentally, I think architects are generalists, that uh, the field requires bringing together the humanities and technology and history and kind of, um, uh, you know, the site, you know, there's so many multivalent um, expertise one needs and, you know, an architect synthesizes all of this. Um, so, you know, there was, I think, a moment in our um, career where we felt that we were, whether we felt like we were experts, I don't think we ever felt like we were experts in electronics and technology, but uh, maybe others saw us as that was our niche and that was our expertise. But in fact, I think we're very context specific. Uh, and so it's like, what is what does that project need? 
you know, what kind of expertise does that project need? And then building the collaborative team that can provide all that expertise and uh, the architect's role being like the synthesizer of this. So it feels whole as opposed to kind of additive and layered or mismatched or something like this, but to synthesize all the expertise one needs for each individual project in a way that feels right for that project. And that gets to questions of pedagogy, right? We're teaching people to think critically. Um, and certainly when we were educated, no one taught us how to work with electronics. No one taught us how to run a community meeting. You know, no one taught us how to, you know, Zoom with a client in China, you know, 10 o'clock at night, you know, to talk about, you know, is it is it the right kind of Chinese feeling? Like there's so much we can't teach, you know, but we can, I think, train people to be able to tackle some of those questions as they come up, right? Um, we're working on a new building for the University of Virginia, which is an institute of democracy, you know, and so we've never designed an institute for democracy, but we have a way to think about it. Um, so I think we can't train people to do things in order to do them again and again. We have to train people to do things that they've never done before. Um, and I think that's exciting, you know, whether it's a house or a dress or an institute of democracy. Um, we think, you know, architects can engage a process that will lead to a, to a great outcome you know, for, the, for the user um, and, and hopefully contribute something meaningful to society, right? Um, we sort of need democracy now, so. <laughs> <laughs> ah, new question. Marissa Yu is asking um, a second. How do you balance medium in your practice? Uh, I think this is referring back to um, the different kinds of medium, both physical, tangible, but also as you in the early in your practice, you had referred to media. Uh, or data as also part of a medium. How do you balance that? I think this is in relation to your, to to the book uh, Verify and Field. And um, sorry, Marissa, I'm not reading your question fast enough. Okay, so I'll just read it. Um, can you share more on Verified and Field book, a new method for documentation that seemed that might change with social media? Uh, thematic techniques that hark back to e Eames. Um, you communicate intensely of Instagram to share more on your obsessive documentation from Instagram to writing. Um, does it remain present? How do you balance these mediums in your practice today? So in the book, I wrote something about why write a book in the age of Instagram, you know, because um, books are so slow. You know, this one took, uh, I don't know, almost 10 years to write. So why write a book? I think you think differently at different speeds, right? Um, to engage a book, you're sort of uh, immersed in the book um, and reflecting on work for writing in a book, I think is a completely different way to think. Um, writing captions on Instagram is a different speed of, of communication. I like to argue that architecture is a broadcast medium. It's sort of broadcast at a certain scale at a certain speed. Um, and so, um, you know, I think it's important to, to think at different speeds, you know, to think quick and to think slow. Um, the book does provide an opportunity to reflect on, on 10 years of work, maybe 12. Um, I think it does mark a kind of shift from the kind of early days of experimentation and electronics with new materials and, and new uh, interfaces to thinking about material after media, like how do we think about stone, you know, in a kind of contemporary way? How do we think about about brick in a contemporary way. All of these materials are now mediated through, you know, design tools, through fabrication processes, through uh, geometrical assemblies, and ultimately through kind of digital surveying equipment to put it in the world uh, precisely. Um, so the book does reflect a little bit on questions of verification, which is a kind of, it's a disciplinary technique, right? It's like, oh, the, the representation is not autonomous. It has to invite in conversation with, with the builder, with the surveyor, with the fabricator. Um, and so this idea of like verifying feel like that little note on a drawing, it sort of opens up a conversation. It sort of pauses a process and says, wait a minute, you know, we need to have a conversation about this. So um, it's a little note we put in our drawings, but it opens up and it tells us so much about 
about the profession, about the about uh, about the world, um, and so we use that to talk about both like the technical in, in architecture, like tolerance, precision, exactitude, but also this kind of social. You know, how do we verify? Wait a minute, you know, the the what the hell is going on? You know, in the world right now, you know, why are there so many, you know, shootings in this country? Like. We need a reality check, you know, and so verification is both technical, but it's also cultural. I think it's also political. Um, how do we sort of get a reality check on on the status of the world as it is? So, um, in the book, um, we use that to sort of open up, you know, from from the technical to the social to the eventually to the environmental. You know, how do we think about architecture um, playing a role at, at these different skits? Um, that's a, a very uh, roundabout way to talk about the book, um, but but yes, um, we we would love to share that with you and and um, and please sort of uh, if you, if you get a hold of the book, let us know what you think because um, I think there's some there's some juicy bits in the book that elaborate on some of these things. Thank you. Um, perhaps maybe in closing, um, would you have any recommendations for our audiences uh, for? for students, uh, you know, a book to read or an architect to follow? Um, or... Book to read. Um, other than verifying fields. <laughs> other than, yeah, in addition to verifying. Yeah, no, no, I, um, I don't watch TV, you know, um, and we don't go to movies anymore uh, because of COVID. So I spend a lot of time with books, um, books that whether they're science fiction books, I just read a book called All Systems Read, kind of, Murderbot Diary. It's a science fiction book about from the point of view of the robot who's hacked his own system to to sort of be free in a way. Um, to Ministry know, of the Future. Ministry of the Future. Yeah, that's Kim Stanley Robinson, a sci-fi writer, looking at sort of the future of climate change and trying to be optimistic. Um, so maybe it requires science fiction to imagine an optimistic future. Um, so science fiction is is we we read a lot of science fiction. Um, and increasingly science fiction is not about the future, it's actually about the present. So we find ourselves being closer and closer, you know, like, no. but um, I just picked up a book called Radical Pedagogies, uh, looking at the kind of history of, of teaching uh, in, in different institutions around the world. So I'm looking forward to that, um, sort of digging in. Um, there's so many great books out there, you guys. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. We actually have um, a lot of messages um, in the chat box. Hopefully you guys can um, read them later. Um, I think yeah. a lot of the, your friend, our friends in um, AA Hong Kong want to welcome you hopefully soon um, to come visit Hong Kong. And so we can have a chat again face-to-face um, -face here in Hong Kong. Um, thank you so much. Um, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, this late in the evening. Thank you, Winston, for moderating this. And thank you, um, Eric and Mijing, um, for doing this. Um, it's wonderful to hear you talk about the project. Thank Thanks you. so much. It's great to see so many familiar names. <laughs> Look forward thank to you. seeing you soon in person, hopefully. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.